You're listening to a LTA Sex Podcast. LTA Sex. Sex positively. Welcome to Behind Closed Doors, the podcast where we talk about sex, relationships, and life completely unedited. I'm your host, Jerome Stewart Nichols, writer, sex and relationship coach, and creator of sexual lifestyle blog, LTAsex.com. If you know me, you know I love talking about sex basically all the time. Uh, Behind Closed Doors is your chance to get a bit more raw and personal with me than ever before. Most often, I'll be talking to my partner and submissive bubby, but you'll hear me musing by myself or sitting in a room with any random person from time to time. Behind Closed Doors definitely isn't your average sex podcast, but it's not about the size. All that matters is how deep and arousing the conversation is. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe and tell your friends about it. You should also consider giving the show a review on iTunes. Make sure to check out LTAsex.com for more from me. You can find more info on Behind Closed Doors at LTAsex.com slash Behind Closed Doors. If you're one of those people using social media, you can also find me, LTA Sex, or Behind Closed Doors on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, SoundCloud, uh, all of that shit. Alright, enough of me talking about this bullshit, let's get to the sex. Alright, we are now officially live. Just go ahead Woo-hoo. and get started. <laughs> okay. Recounting the story that we just lost. <laughs> <laughs> To uh, to to go back the the uh, the story as of uh, as it was happening, um, uh, basically after um, having sort of like a really good uh, a, a turn in our lives personally, my husband and I um, deciding to open back up again um, after having kids for a couple of years, and things are going really well. Felt really happy and sexy, and uh, made us better parents. Um, we, uh, then had to deal with things really changing in my husband's job. Um, it had sort of been slowly coming. Um, we'd sort of seen this from the distance, the, the, um, the work in LA was, uh, starting to leave town. Um, the way we weren't paying very well. And then for the first time in his really long career, he found himself, uh, jobless at basically the worst time of the year. And, He'd never been let go from a job before, been been laid off. And so it was devastating for him personally. Uh, self-esteem just, just like crushed. Um, and then we very quickly went from, um, you know, being able to have fun and go to parties and go to dungeons and, and be the sort of happy, happy, you know, sexy people we were, uh, to very quickly going into survival mode. Um, everything was about, um, making sure that we could pay rent. And then he, he was unemployed for nine months. Um, and LA is really expensive. <laughs> uh, there's almost no cheap place to live out there unless you're like, you know, 90 minutes out in the desert. Um, and it was tough. It, it came at a hard time in my uh, career. I was you know, writing and, and podcasting and uh, it, it wound up being you know, tough having your sexy personal life kind of disappear when you're trying to talk about having a happy, uh, fulfilled sex life <laughs> <laughs> and hair. Um, but, I, you know, we wound up having to make some really big changes. We moved. Um, he's working out of state, so he's only home two weekends a month. So that completely changes our relationship. And in the process of all this, I wound up uh, having, uh, I've, I've battled depression all my life. And um, it really tr- highly triggered it. I, I went into a very deep depression, um, but turned my libido off. It was like a pilot light just going off. Uh, just one day I was like, why am I having a hard time getting turned on? This is really weird. Um, I'm multi-orgasmic and I can barely get to one. Uh, it, was, it was kind of frightening. It's like my body had just rebelled and had just decided to turn everything off because I was in, in sort of high stress survival uh, mode. And I really had to figure out a way to get out of that. Um, you know, our life, I've, I'm taking care of two kids at home by myself. Um, we're trying to maintain a, you know, a healthy relationship being long distance. Um, I've in the course of the move and everything I've gone through, I've lost a lot. I've lost some of my partners. So I have to find new partners and it's really hard to feel like sexy enough to want to go out and go to play parties and date and, and, you know, live a life non-monogamous, um, 
when you're kind of exhausted and tired and not feeling um, very good about yourself. <laughs> yes, <laughs> when, I all about that. <laughs> I was like, I think there's a, you know, a lot of people out there that can identify with that. And in, in sort of the process of turning to this um, really amazing community that I found since I've started writing and podcasting, I have through the sex positive um, people and everybody from educators to just fans of the show, um, you know, life on the swing set and um, just who I've met online friends I've made. I've, I have this amazing support system that I've never had in my entire life. So I had people I could talk to who knew a lot about themselves and about uh, how things work and, and, and gave me great perspectives on things. And the thing that kept coming up was that there's a whole bunch of us who, deal with depression a lot and um we don't know if it's a um like a symptom of our being of us being creative people or um we're more uh, empathetic and open people and that's why we're we're in sex education but uh we were finding oh, there's a lot of us in this industry that deal with uh depression on a daily basis and then I met this, you know, sort of another group of people like uh, Joellen, who's the redhead bedhead, and, and Krista Ann, who um, was doing Orgasm Quest, and uh, Dr. Stephen Biggs, who's uh, uh, joining up with Joellen, talking about how depression can lead towards sexual dysfunction. And that you, you can, it can kill your libido, and it can be hard to date and hard to function. And, but it's important to try and figure out how to way to get your sexy back while you're dealing with depression because being sexy and having sex in, sort of does the opposite for depression. It can increase your um, hormone levels and make you feel better about yourself, but they're sort of battling each other. Right. Uh, and in the process of that, um, when I saw Krista Ann going through her orgasm quest where she has to be on, um, she's a mother and you know, dealing with, you know, with all of her kids, very much younger kids than mine, but also having to be put on, uh, medication for her depression that turned her ability to have orgasms off and she was not going to stand for that yeah, yeah. and decided to find ways to get her body to respond and as we're all talking to each other we found that there was uh, a lot of mothers out there who were dealing with both of these really big issues and that's how to be a parent and a mother you know uh, how to be a good partner uh, while this specter of depression is uh, making it hard to even get through the day but then it's also really making it hard for you to uh, be in touch with your sexual selves and as educators trying to help people have very fulfilling sex lives um, it was very distressing yeah and but in that process of uh, talking about it, we realize, well, this is what we need to do. We need to talk about how we're struggling and we're going through these times where our bodies are rebelling against us and our brains are rebelling against us. And a group of us wound up talking at Catalyst Con West and just the, um, the, the, the tweets alone during our motherhood, sex and depression panel was like, really made me feel like I was on a path I needed to be on. Is as much fun as it is to talk about, you know, group sex and play parties and kinky stuff, which I still love to do and I'm not giving up. Um, I think there are people out there that feel very much alone in their struggles, uh, have forgotten what it's like to be sexy as moms, uh, how to bounce back from what happens in your body during pregnancy and all the stuff afterwards and having um, monkeys hanging on you all day long <laughs> 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 and then not wanting anybody to touch you at the end of the day, but how much you need it, you know, how touch is important and, and uh, orgasms are important and all that stuff is so uh, good for you and also makes you a better parent. So I'm, I, you know, I've, I, it's been sort of a uh, an interesting turn, like my life turned in a, in a different way. But I think it it also gave me a gift, and that is having a topic I didn't think I'd ever talk about <laughs> in public. Um, and before we go any further, that's mm -hmm. that's a really good introduction to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, mm -hmm. But before we go any further, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone listening? Well, hi everyone. I'm uh, Miko Technogesha. Uh, basically, online everybody knows me as Technogesha, but uh, I do have a first name, which is Miko. 
And uh, I just, I love to write. I love to podcast. I love to talk about sexuality and um, monogamy and kink. And uh, I love to educate. I love to help people find better ways to feel, feel good. <laughs> All right. And, and feeling good is where we're going to start. Actually, we're going to go back a bit to uh, depression because that's one thing that I've been dealing with on and off, especially in this last year, wherein uh, I'm having like my first long-term partner. And mm. instead of being able to, you know, just go online and get sex whenever I want to, or whenever I feel like it, you know, I'm also having to make sure that he is, um, mm-hmm. being sexually satisfied even when I don't exactly feel like it <laughs> you have, I think that you're talking about having long-term partnerships is where um, you know dealing with depression can really be a struggle and it's often hard for someone who hasn't been very uh, long in your life if this is a new long-term relationship for them to have experienced the those ups and downs that depression can really do to you. Um, I know in, in uh, you know, new relationships I've had, when I had that really big, deep first dip in depression, they were like, whoa, <laughs> I did not know how to handle that. It was a little intense. But just as you said, you have to look also into your, uh, towards your partner's um, needs too. And that can be tough when your body is telling you, I really want to just curl up in a ball in bed and not get up and talk to anybody or let anybody touch you. And it's really important at that point to realize that depression lies. And a lot of it is turning things on in your, 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 your brain. You have things like cortisol and epiphedrine that are, that are going off that are putting you in sort of a, a weird fight or flight um, uh, mode um, it's you know changing your body. It's changing your blood pressure. It's shutting things down, um, and so it shuts down your libido because at that point, when you're dealing with depression and all of that, it's uh, uh, making all those other things unimportant to you. And you sort of have to fake your body out at that point and fake your mind out. Um, you know, I'll, and there's also things that they don't know that's going on in your brain. They're talking about things like serotonin and norepinephrine, and dopamine, and uh, what is going on in the mind of the depressive that turns things off and you know that's why there are people on the the serotonin uh reuptake that uh they're saying that uh serotonin is not getting is getting reabsorbed and that's why you're not feeling good about yourself so that prevents it um but it's really hard to like sit there and go i don't feel good about myself and i have to feel good about my partner one thing i've learned about that is that when i try to like ignore that voice that tells me i don't want it and I go, let's go have a just sexy time together, even though I don't feel it. Usually sometime in there, it kicks in and I start feeling really good. <laughs> I don't know if, that, that, if that's happened to you, if you've um, realized I need to do this for my partner and found a way to get into it. Have you like um, suddenly tur- things turned on for you? Yeah, no, that's exactly the the, be- the best thing so far that I've learned how to just – get over that hump is to actually let my body get aroused and then let my mind sort of like, Oh yeah, I'm liking what's going on. Although I don't want this, I'm just going to go ahead and be excited about this because this is exciting. (laughs) Exactly. This is sort of like you're, you have to take that time to ignore the, the words that are, that depression are trying to tell you. And, you know, and as I said, you know, depression is constantly lying to you. It's constantly, you know, telling you these things that, no, I really don't want that. I don't want to, but sometimes your body is responding, even though your brain is saying these things. And so sometimes like what's helped me is, um, making appointments for sex, like, Hey, let's have a sexy evening and, and, really like tune out the world for a little while. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer for me to get into it. And with a long-term relationship too, sometimes when they see that you're not immediately turned on, that fills them with doubt that, well, maybe my partner isn't really hot for me or maybe in trying to have that talk with them and reassure them that what's going on with what depression is doing to your brain and your body is not indicative to how you really feel about them. And it can be exhausting as often I feel like I'm constantly reassuring my partner 
that no, I find you attractive and I love you and I really want to be with you. Um, a lot of it is societal. It's what we've seen in movies and TV that you, you know, people are hot for each other and turned on. A lot of that is really NRE. It's only at the beginning of relationships. Uh, in a lot of relationships, it doesn't hang on and it starts to cool off. And then when you have, add on depression on top of that, um, it can make it seem to your partner that you're not interested, but assure them and go, let's just keep going. And so when my body starts to react, know that that's honest and real. And, you know, my body is hot for you. I need to psych out my brain right now. Uh, you know. <laughs> and honestly, though, for him, he also deals with depression. Uh, so ha having to get that part was not having to get him to understand it was not so difficult. But for me, being, you know, this being my first long term relationship and my first uh, time absolutely having to um, sort of deal with these things and not just being able to go into myself for a couple of weeks while it works itself out, I've had to learn for myself that me not responding immediately was not so bad. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, me the sensations of my body not being as grand as they normally are, you know, that, that doesn't mean I'm not going to be able to have enjoyable sex. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to get your, to uh, like get past your own inner chatter right. in your head. You start saying things like, Oh, if my body's not responding, then I must not be, I must not want this or I must not be really into it. And, it's it's hard to uh, fake yourself out, and I know I've done that. I've done that. Uh, what happens to me a lot is when I'm really exhausted, and I've been through so much in a day, and especially with kids. Um, there's parents out there, out there that can probably identify this. When you've been running around, and everybody's been asking you for things, and you're exhausted at the end of the day, your first reaction is going to be, I really don't want to put forth any more effort anymore. <laughs> Can I just take a nap? <laughs> but I, I find that when I stop uh, sort of listening to that voice and saying, well, no, I think what I really need is that connection time and that, um, you know, you know a, a great orgasm is a good way to end a stressful day. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and finding ways to um, – have that dialogue with myself and not let um, that other tired voice, like you're saying, like sometimes you just, you sit there and you go, well, maybe I'm not really into it because it's not happening organically. But remind, I remind myself, I was like, well, no, it's going to feel really good when I get it going. <laughs> and <laughs> it's going to melt all the stuff I had to deal with during the day. And it can seem like, um, a massive undertaking sometimes to to get sexy time going. And I think when it seems like a massive undertaking and a lot of effort that something's wrong with it, but give yourself some slack because you are fighting a whole lot physically uh, and mentally. And if your life is stressful, if you have a lot going on and your day is very complicated, um, you're fighting a lot to get to the core of what your body needs. And uh, you sort of have to get, cut yourself a little, uh, a little slack mentally um, and go, well, maybe I don't really think this way. It's just the result of all of this constant input and stress and everything that's going on during the day. Yeah. I, you know, when I've started to sort of like put that into practice or like, let's, let's just go ahead with it. The, the way I've sort of um, put that to work is that I'll just say, you know, I don't want to have sex right now, but I could, I could, I can have a blowjob. Like that's, that, doesn't seem, that doesn't take much work. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so like if I could just lay there and do nothing and try to relax for a minute and get my heart to stop racing and, you know, get, get my mind to clear then, you know, eventually I might actually, you know, want to go ahead and have that sex thing. Yeah, right. And normally I do. And yeah. normally I do. Yeah, and that's great. It's like, yeah, you you found the, you know, the the, uh, the the sort of like the easiest path to get to where you want to go. And and that was very important for you to realize that sometimes sex could be a fulfilling, you know, sexual experience can just be let's have a blowjob. 
Right. And if that's all it is, that's awesome because we had a wonderful intimate time together. But that first intimate thing could l- spark things and lead to something else. And sometimes, like we've realized, well, maybe we can start with playing with toys and trying to get me aroused. But it might be where I can't turn over my motor, but I can do something for my partner. Where, you know, where maybe our fulfilling experience is just I give him a blowjob and we have an intimate time together. And and that is good right there. What was interesting about when I started doing that with my partner is I found that he felt that he wasn't doing enough if I didn't orgasm. That he had to keep going and he had to keep working on it. <laughs> and after a while, I was just like, okay, please stop. <laughs> I appreciate the effort. Really do. I (laughs) I do. But sometimes when my body's not responding after a while, it it becomes the opposite. It starts to not feel good. Mm -hmm. And I had to reassure him that the prize here doesn't have to be both of us orgasming. It could be just, I have this wonderful physical connection with you. And if you orgasm and I don't, that's fine. I'm actually okay with that because I understand where my body is right now. And I would much rather have spent intimate physical touch time with you, which is very important. Um, just the bonding and the touch and, um, yeah, that's releasing wonderful chemicals, you know, in your brain. That can be enough for you and reassuring your partner that this is okay. This is all I need right now can, uh, take the pressure off of them from feeling like they have to give you more than, than, than what they're giving you. Exactly. I, for he, uh, my guy is also my submissive and he's always very sort of trying to make sure that I'm okay and that I'm taken care of and, mm-hmm. and, you know, making sure that my needs are met. And I'm like, you know, sometimes, sometimes I have no needs <laughs> to be met. Or yeah. like, I don't want anything. My need is for like, you to be calm and happy and if that means that like i need to tie you up or you know we to do some sensation play or you need to call one of your other partners that is perfectly fine with me and i i am happy to just let you go ahead and have your fun right and that's a great important conversation to have and especially from someone who for someone who is a submissive you know being a submissive i totally get that you know you, you're you almost can't turn that off it's all about the you know you you want your um you know your partner to get all the service from you that they require um but having that conversation and saying no sometimes what makes me feel good is you getting what you need uh, really puts them at ease, puts you at ease, and uh, puts both of you in a more relaxed place. Like you're saying, I want you to be calm. I want you to be, you know, so that you can enjoy each other. And redefining what is um, uh, fulfilling and pleasurable. Exactly. And I, with him, with him, I, I like to, the blowjob is actually one thing that is permissible because he enjoys it as much as I do. Mm-hmm. Because it's a, it's a way for him to service me. So he's getting satisfied and I'm also getting satisfied. And we're also working towards the possibility of, you know, full on intercourse or doing anything else that we want to do. Mm. It's, 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 it's really beneficial and it's really worked out well for us. <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> as I, as I, as I speak, he's walking around. He just got back from the store. <laughs> he's going to dye his hair green today. Awesome. Yeah. We're, we're, we're a couple of candy colored. <laughs> <laughs> I love that though. That is so cool. Oh, uh, but th- yeah, I've, I've really, and I've really come to, even when I'm not depressed, I've really come to enjoy sort of like relaxing with a blowjob or starting with some cuddles or, <laughs> or just sitting there in quiet and peace or, you know, going out and sitting outside and having a cigarette. And trying to find like ways that we can both be intimate and I can find ways to calm myself, which is one of my biggest issues when I'm depressed is that, you know, my heart starts racing mm-hmm. and my head, my head won't stop moving and everything's terrible and anything bad that happens automatically sort of like gets 100% of my attention, no matter what I'm doing. <laughs> right. This is great. You have found so many like 
wonderful um, solutions. And a lot of people never see that. They never sort of see that, that bigger picture of what they need in managing um, what goes on in that chatter in their head and what goes on with them physically. So it's great that you've really gotten like, okay, oh, sometimes I just need a color, cuddle. And, um, and also what I love about it too is the idea that you're trying to be in the moment and this is something that I'm learning a lot now uh, because I go through that whole thing. There's anxiety and you get so caught up in where your brain is going and then you're, you're worrying that one thing that just happened makes you worried about the thing that's going to happen a month from now and then <laughs> six months from now. The next thing you know, you've imagined the entire year of your life is, you know, this <laughs> awful apocalypse. Everything is going to go wrong because this one thing happened and doing something physically like cuddling or just or having that like you said you know that that moment of having the blow job it takes you out of your mind and out of the brain and puts you in what's considered like a mindfulness moment right. where you're dealing with your needs and your partner's needs in that moment and it could be and i've and this is the thing i've i've had the same discussion with my husband because the hard part of me not wanting sex all the time is trying to get him to understand that what i need from him him is not always sex not always you know you know piv penis and vagina multi you know orgasmic uh you know sweaty and lying exhausted on the bed sex is wonderful but at yeah, this at this stage sometimes it's curling up in bed together and, you know, laying my head on his chest and, and just having that moment of just enjoying that. Yeah. And that may not lead to anything else, but I need that to get myself in a better place so that the really hot and sexy stuff can happen <laughs> <laughs> either later on or another date it's uh, it's like maintenance. It's soul. Yeah. It's maintenance for your soul. Absolutely. I um I found out I, I in in all of my travels and all of my self study, which I do a lot. Um, I found out that the number one thing that I sort of need to be okay with life is just peace, mm -hmm. tranquility. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure why, but I I do well under stress. But under, like, chaos, I'm not very good. I, I can't, like, eventually I just break. And I'm like, well, I can work. I can continue to do things. But I do not feel good inside. <laughs> oh, I totally get this. I totally get this because I, I, I'm very much the same way. Um, I've always been somebody who has been able to deal with, like, high stressful situations. I've always been the go-to person to get things done. Right. But – I get it done because there's sort of like an orderly fashion to what I do. And when the stress is chaos and I can't rein it in and so much is going around that I can't um, get a handle on everything, it becomes, it is, it, I, I suddenly can't handle it anymore. And I'm like, okay, all of you people and all this madness needs to go away because I can't handle this right now. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like Can last you... year, last year I was, um, I, I had come off like this great year with LTA sex. I had great traffic, all these cool guests, all these reviews. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers were great. We were starting to make a little bit of money, but you know what? I was doing it all by myself. Oh <laughs> man. And like I had an editor, but that was it. So, yeah. you know, I'm doing the website, I'm doing social, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And all these plates are spinning. And then, like, at a certain point, one plate just started getting wobbly. Mm -hmm. And then another, and another, and another. And then I was just like, I can't do it. <laughs> and then ended up, like, stopping working for yeah. six months. Wow. Wow, I didn't realize it was that long. I know I was seeing lots of you on there. And then all of a sudden, I was, I was like, what happened? <laughs> There's like really cool stuff going on here. But I know that, you know, sometimes things happen and people have to like, you know, and then I was busy too. I thought, well, maybe it's just me. I'm not on social media yeah. uh, as often anymore. But, I, you know, the spinning plates is exactly how I describe what goes on in my life. It is so true that you can only have so many sp plates spinning at once. And doing it all by yourself, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that, that anything, uh, especially when you're trying to keep up with social media and doing all the other stuff, 
Um, but you know what? I, you're probably also like me in that you're a very driven person and you're very passionate yeah, about very. what you do. And sometimes that passion pushes you along before you realize that you're overwhelmed. Absolutely. And then because you love what you do so much, it's hard to look at all those plates and realize you're going to have to take some of them down, or you're going to have to take the time to pass that along to someone else. Pass that along. That was the one I had to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that can be hard, especially if it's your baby. And, you know, it's like, I remember this, um, going through this with Cooper when I first started at swing set is he pretty much did everything. And he was going through that. He was starting to crumble because he, he, you know, was doing the, you know, he had an editor, you know, who was doing with all the audio stuff, but all the website stuff and all the social media stuff. And it was sort of like, no, I'm afraid to have other people do this. Cause what if they don't, I've had people not do it right. Or, and I'm like, just give me what you can <laughs> trust me. Mm -hmm. And when you start delegating, you will see more growth and that's what happened. We started, you know, just us doing it and then getting everybody else involved and bringing people. It is hard though when it is, you know, your, your, your dream and your child and your, uh, your passion to find someone that you trust enough to share that with. But it's important too for growth because eventually you will keep adding more and more plates as you grow and you, you start getting more numbers and, um, you can't keep all that going and have a life. You know? and have a life. That's that was that was the part that I, w I wasn't having. I wasn't having a life. I wasn't de-stressing ever. Yeah, yeah, and and that's kind of where, in a way, where I am now is that I was always the person to be able to take everybody's you know, uh, you know, everybody's plates, you know, you're having trouble with that show, you know, I'll come in and I'll do, you know, like a, for body, I did volunteer stuff and I was doing stuff for swing set and I was doing stuff for sex seekdom, very fulfilling. But when my partner was taken out of the equation as doing ha half of the work in the house, I had to acknowledge that my free time was limited. And man, was it so hard to not be there for people. That's an integral part of my being is being there for people and being supportive and making, helping their, their dreams grow and, and want to be there to see things happen. And I felt like I was letting people down. And what I had to realize is that I had to have less plates spinning in order for me to have life because what was happening is I was, now turning off things in living life in order to keep being there for people. And it's been a very difficult um, transition for me to go, I need to be all about the self-care right now. <laughs> and people had to remind me, get out of the house. Go, when was the last time you like went on a date? When was the last time you went to a play party? When was the last time you like went to a coffee house and talked to someone? I realized I hadn't done that. It was all about my children and my partner and my work. And you realize that I'm sure that, yes. you know, I need, you, you need to, you know, Jerome needs some <laughs> time for Jerome. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I also need a time for like our relationship to it, grow. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and to, you know, you don't. Sometimes you don't realize it when you're, when you're uh, pursuing your passion. When your partner is like, okay, you know, it's the middle of the night and you're still online, and you know, can I take a number? And you know, and and be next in line for your attention. Um, it's really hard to find that balance. And it yeah. sounds like that you've, um, that you're finding that. I'm, I'm finding it. Yes. I'm still working on it <laughs> because uh, he lives with me now. Um, mm -hmm. He had a tumultuous uh, family life at his, at his, he was still living with his family as most millennials are. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so, so eventually that was like taking a toll on our relationship because like I said, he also deals with depression and anxiety and his are worse than mine because he hadn't lived in a family that was like 
emotionally intelligent very mm. and they and they were very uh petty and they were very sort of like if you're mad you yell and you scream and you do whatever and you say whatever and then everybody just sort of forgets about it yeah wow that's that's a hard life to like a, a hard family life to go through exactly. and i know people who have lived through that and and I, in a way, I had a very similar upbringing, upbringing too, where there was very little emotional intelligence going on yeah. uh, in my family. And there's a, a lot of yelling and a lot of uh, a very self-centeredness in how people treated each other. And uh, it was something that I had to realize how it colored the way I um, dealt with partners and with other people and how um, it can make you very defensive Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, distrusting of uh, people's sincerity. And it can be very difficult in a relationship. It's like something that my husband and I had to deal with uh, very early on. And it, he sort of had the different thing. He had, he had a much, it sounds like very similar to you, where he had a much more loving and caring family and more of a, um, a traditional family, whereas very mine's true. crazy as all get out. Um, and also, you know, born again Christian. Uh, that that was that was his family, the born again Christian. Oh, that, yeah, hey, I, he and I can <laughs> totally relate on that. Man, it is not easy to grow up with born again Christian parents. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, no, it was it's terrible. Like I I I didn't really know the extent of it, but like mm-hmm. he he, uh, I want to say seven months into our relationship, he had a seizure, Ooh. had amnesia, and then he went back to live with them for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Now he hasn't been living with them for months and they don't really know that much about his new life. And the first couple of things they start telling him about are like how he needs to find Jesus and how Jesus will get him through this. He's coming coming back to visit me. And he's like, I am so scared of these people. Like (laughs) I don't know them. And they keep talking about this magic man. Yeah. He's got to make all your troubles disappear. And he's like, I don't like it. It makes me uncomfortable. I was like, I'm sure it does, sweetie. I, I, yeah, I'm sure yeah. it does. <laughs> yeah, just, just nod and smile. <laughs> Basically, that's what that's what he had to do because they they are insane. Yeah, there's there's no way you can't even argue. I stopped doing that years ago with my family, you know, because it it it, it is they're programmed. It, it it is truly like a uh, cult like. Yeah. In that there's no way to have a logical argument. And they don't even care. There's not even like, let's agree to disagree. That is, you have to be wrong. You have to be, exactly. And you have to do what we do. You know, and so there are lots of times where the, you know, they're like, you haven't told your family about this. And, you, and I was like, I am not telling my family anything. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need to know. Because it would cause so much more strife because then I'm, you know, it's, I would be happy if they just prayed for me and stopped talking to me, but I know that's not what's going to happen is I'm going to get phone calls and I'm going to get pestered and you're going to go to hell and I have to save you. It's like, let me live my life the way I want. I want to go to hell. Let me go to hell. <laughs> I'm going to have gonna a, be a great party there. Doing the, yeah. <laughs> All my friends are going to be there. So, <laughs> I like in, in my family. I was I was very very lucky in the way that my mother. She's she's um, a very traditional woman. She's very quiet. She doesn't like to share feelings a lot, mm. but. She also understands a lot of things that she doesn't say. She's a very, like, quiet, thoughtful person. Mm. Uh, So once I was asking her about religious stuff, and she never really pushed it on me. She let me come to it in my own time. And I asked her why she believed. Her Mm. response was, you know, even if it's not true, it makes me feel good, and that's enough. And I was like... So insightful. Yeah, and I was like, that is... The best answer anyone has ever given me. And, <laughs> and, and, and like, I'm an atheist, but I, I still get that religion does have benefits. So mm-hmm. when, you, when you say it to me like that, and when you say it in that very, like, this sort of, like, peacefulness, it's like meditation. Yes. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I've seen the, you know, it's sort of funny, what I, you know, what I've seen it from afar is that 
we're able to connect to energies in our body. You know, our bodies are these just amazing machines. And I think that when you take the, like how your mother is, that core idea of religion and finding comfort in it and that it's meditative, um, I think that's when sort of having a religious uh, sort of um, dogma helps you because it's a way of focusing finding something that calms you. Uh, prayer can be equivalent to somebody meditating or um, bringing you some call. It's when it, when it gets all like crazy with telling people how to live their lives is when I have a problem with it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, well, I'll, I'll be, mm-hmm. and I'll be honest, even as an atheist, I do use a lot of like religious practices in order to um, find peace because they're, they're very uh, universal. For example, mm-hmm. the way I sort of deal with my anxieties about work and life and relationships and things is I sort of rely on the serenity prayer mm-hmm. because it's very simple. You know, understand the things that you can, learn yourself. Uh, if you can't do it, don't bother with it and just try to be happy. Yeah. Do the best you can. And that is that as a person who's, I need to be great at this. I need to be the best. I need to. Oh. <laughs> I need I to win. I need to. Yeah, it's like it's one of those people. It's like this is this is very like. Oh wow! I don't have to be number one. I could be like number three and still be fine. And and it okay. could be still pretty awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and also when you're like that too, is that you're constantly um, needing control in your life. Yes. yes, and you feel like, well, if I do A, B, C, I will get D. But then mm-hmm. life comes along and like tweaks C and then throws you to F and you're like, <laughs> wait, it's not, I did what I was supposed to do. Exactly. And, and you have to remember that the universe is about a lot of random stuff and people are, can be very random. And it's, and I, like I said, I totally, cause I do this and I'm like, well, I did this and this happened and why isn't this going the way I want it to go? And it's wonderful that you use the serenity prayer to remind yourself of that, that sometimes things aren't going to go not just the way I want to go, but the way I feel like I have done everything to make it go. Yeah. Just simply because that is the way the universe works yeah. and having, finding calmness and stillness in that moment will also help you figure out what to do now that you're at F <laughs> instead exactly. of being angry about it. <laughs> and, and, uh, and for me, that F was, you know, his seizure, which is completely through a wrench in our relationship. Yeah. Um, it, it ended up, ha- we had to sort of like restart. I had to completely restart with the emotional intelligence and mm-hmm. helping him deal with his emotions and being mindful. And that, Wow, that was stressful because I was like, I, I've done all this already. I don't want to do it again. Like, I, I, I thought we were good. Oh, my gosh. Why am I back to the beginning again? Oh, but at the same time, it, that, that, that same sort of uh, the serenity prayer sort of like uh, mentality helped me find peace when it was happening and when I didn't know what was going on mm-hmm. and when – uh, you know, he was having a seizure on my living room floor. Wow. And, you know, when he's getting taken away from taken away by the ambulance. And, you know, when I walk in and he's like, who are you? Oh, wow. That is mind blowing. Yeah. The, 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 what, what is what that does that blow to you in that moment is devastating. It is. That's, you know, and it's, it's, you need to cling on to whatever you can at that point to keep yourself you're, you know, together for yourself and for your partner. Especially for him, because he, I, I am his boyfriend, but I'm also his dom, and I'm also sort of um, his only, like, source of, like, sensible family that he has. Wow. So there's a lot of pressure there. You know? There is. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, and uh, that can then trigger your, your depression and a lot of stress and your anxiety. Yeah. You know, and it, I, I guess it becomes one of those things where you have to take a moment to take care of yourself and center yourself so that you can be strong for your partner. Um, and it's good that you didn't let the stress of the situation forget that, uh, you know, we've, uh, this has come up a lot and we're ta- uh, talking about this kind of situation in which you have to put your oxygen mask on first. Right. Before you can 
help your, you know, someone else with it. So you had to get centered and you had to figure out, okay, how do I get strong? How do I not let this completely push me over the edge and still be there for my partner? You know, hey, wow, I commend you. That's a lot to go through. Um, and I appreciate it. I honestly, though, I have to thank my other two partners uh, for for their assistance during that time. Mm-hmm. Um, even, even if it was just like allowing me to share, enjoy their body or uh, an ear to, to talk to or sort of like bounce things off of or just a vent. Mm-hmm. My, my other two partners were very helpful in ways I don't think they understand. I actually, I think I should tell them. Yeah. I think I should tell them definitely. that. Sure know. Yeah. Because the littlest things sometimes can be very, you know, powerful and, and life altering for you. And I think this is also like how wonderful that we can have other people in our lives like this, you know, that there's other partners that you can just be like, can I just have like a hug right now? Mm-hmm. You know, that in a way that you may not people who, you know, don't have um, open relationships and multiple partners, you know, may not have that place to go. Cool. And you know, that's one thing that, that we're trying to remind ourselves that even though we're a little bit thrown off, it's been hard for me not having my partner, my primary partner here. Um, I'm used to having that reconnection with him, you know, when, when we go out or when I, I'm with somebody solo and going, well, no, I have this wonderful gift in that we can have other people in our lives. He has um, two other partners right now that he can turn to when we're having a hard time or when I'm having a really hard day, he has someone else that he can go and, and have cuddle time and make him stronger so that he can be, be there for me. And how wonderful that you have partners that are there for you. I, 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 I didn't know that that was sort of like one of the big things about Polly when I, before I actually got into it, I've always sort of been, I, uh, I, I, I guess the closest thing you could say is like a serial monogamist. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's what a lot of people do. <laughs> yeah, but it, but I, I just when I when I tell people how I how I date, I just say I like to hole around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're honest. <laughs> because I do. Because honestly, I I treat new partners and old partners pretty much with the same sort of. Uh, of course, the same level of respect and sort of consideration, but I, mm. I give them a lot of the same levels of priority and I'll mm. help them and I'll take care of them and I'll, you know, whatever. I, I try to give them uh, the best partner that they can have if that's, if that's me. You know oh, I mean? that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So it, it, it's a little different, but I didn't realize how beneficial that could be to actually hold on to several partners at a time in a more consistent basis. Mm. People like to say that you need to find your one partner (laughs) and do that on a consistent basis. But that's not really true because one, or or at least not for me, because one partner is definitely not enough, especially when, you know, he doesn't know who I am or (laughs) or he's he's just had a manic episode and I just do not want to see his face (laughs) or like, you know what I mean? Yeah. You need to step away sometimes in order. Yeah. And what I think was that is important to note here is that you made this thing called Polly what you need it to be. And right now that's what it is. It's like what you need it to be is to have you know, these, all these partners, all sort of equal is what makes you feel good. And it works for your partners. It, it bring, it gives them the best your own <laughs> that you can give them. And it makes, you know, I think we sometimes get, especially in poly, get caught up with how things need to be done. And that whole idea of, well, no, everybody, you have to have a primary and then everybody's secondary. It's like, I'm so glad that you like threw all that stuff out of the window <laughs> and did what worked for you. So that I, you I really don't even like the idea of having secondary partners. Mm-hmm. I, I've been trying to find a new word for it. And recently um, I, I heard somebody say anchor partner. Oh, that's a great term. I, well, I you can really have more like than one. That. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I would consider both, you know, my Bubby who lives with me, uh, an anchor partner, as well as uh, my other partner, Noah, who doesn't live with me. Mm-hmm. I also consider my anchor partner. And 
it, it denotes something, I don't know, equally loving? Yeah. Yeah, but you, you don't also have to feel like, you know, one person has more say or more power or more time or, you know, because your feelings towards them probably are not divided in that way. They really aren't. Yeah. So why should you have to, you know, sort of delineate your their relationships with you that way? If exactly. you feel equally about everybody, they're all equally your anchors, which is awesome <laughs> and wonderful. Yeah. I, I think if, if people just sort of let the relationships grow and be what they are organically and worry less about uh, where they are, I guess, percentage wise, or um, that you'd probably have a lot more successful long, long-term relationships because mm-hmm. you're not trying to figure out, well, no, I, I have to spend more time with this person because they're my primary or um, it's, it's more freeing. I think what, yeah. what, you know, doing it in the anchor way. And, and you know what you saying that the, uh, you'll have more successful long-term relationships they immediately made me feel bad because now I forgot that I actually have three. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you should feel, is it a new? The no, no. He's the longest term one. Uh, it's just that I don't see him very often. Oh, He, he lives mm, maybe 45 minutes, an hour away. And we talk via chat a lot. Mm-hmm. And when we're, when we're in town, we'll hang out. Um, but we've, we've been together for mm, nine years. Wow. Years. That's amazing. I, 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 it's only now, honestly, that I'm thinking about it in sort of like that. Oh, wow. I've had a successful relationship go, you know, almost a decade or, you know, that's, that's cool. It's very cool. <laughs> it is very cool because it's hard to main, maintain. It's hard to maintain one person for nine years. Yeah. You know, uh, but you know, when you, when you're dealing with multiple relationships, sometimes it's because it, like uh, they move away. There's a uh, difference in how much time you can spend together. And that's beautiful that your relationship is, has grown and expanded and worked for what works with where you guys are mm-hmm. at, you know, uh, at this time that you can be far away from each other and still be close enough to feel like your partnerships are still there and are still active. Cause sometimes people give up on that, especially when it's long distance. Yeah. How, how did, how did you work out your relationships? It's, um, it's funny. I had to completely, I, I'm completely redefining my relationships uh, is what I'm doing. Um, everything's sort of on hold was on hold because I had to focus. This is the problem of being a parent. I had to focus on my kids and it was really hard for me to maintain my other relationships while I was focused on my kids. So while I'm still in touch with people, um, they're not sort of active as partners right now. And I feel like because I've changed a lot in the past year that what I need from a partner has changed. So I'm sort of going to go back into uh, dating and relationships with sort of a different uh, need for my partners. So, and then the long distance between one of them was too much. So we've sort of lost contact with each other, unfortunately. Um, but I want to develop new pe- new relationships. And I think, you know, it's like, I'm sort of, I've, uh, I'm like in a reboot phase, <laughs> okay. I guess I could say, where I'm letting go of old relationships to start new ones that fit the insanity of my life right now. Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I didn't have relationships that were able to survive that. And I have one, though, that didn't end. It's just been redefined. We're, we don't have a physical relationship anymore, but we're still very close. And um, he's still very much a part of the daily part of my life and, um, you know, helps me through a lot. We just decided to not have a physical relationship anymore. Yeah. And You know, it's interesting. When you were talking, I was listening and I was trying to uh, I was thinking about how, how you set up your relationships and I was realizing that I don't think, or now that I'm thinking about it, I tend not to have ends to my relationships. Mm-hmm. They tend to just sort of 
oh, I'm moving. Oh, that's sad. I won't get to see you anymore. <laughs> yeah. But we'll st- we'll still stay in touch. And if I come back in town, you know, we'll hang out. You know, we may have sex. We may not. I mean, I would like to have sex because that sex was great. But <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, yeah, that's pretty much what I have going on right now is that there wasn't a, hey, we're going to end this. It's just sort of, all right, when we see each other, we see each other. And we're, you know, a, 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 some of uh, um, my relationships, we still keep touch via text. And it's like, okay, when you come back, we'll hang out. And it is, it's sort of like we didn't really end anything. It's just redefined as we deal with the distance and the time we can spend together. And that some of them are actually, you know, we're just, we're closer in a sense that we still talk to each other and we're still there for each other. And if the other stuff happens when we are together, that would be awesome. But we're not like worried about making that happen. You know, I, I listening to the way that like the, the way both of us have set up our lives, it makes me think about how people in monogamous relationships should set up their lives. Mm-hmm. I feel like they, I feel like there's a lot to be learned from the sort of uh, uh, wavy, go with the flow way that both both you and I have have decided to go with our relationships. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of monogamous relationships they are one thing. That's what they are. They don't change, and mm-hmm. if they have to change, that means they have to end. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've seen this happen with friends. And even before um, I became, you know, I, 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 I don't want to say I became non-monogamous because I feel like I was my entire life. It's just yeah. I finally gave myself the permission to actually do it and be it and be who I am 100% honestly. Um, I could always see that I had that way of looking at things from the very beginning. And I would have, you know, friends of mine who would get into relationships and I could see that train wreck happening. And where they you know, or all of a sudden I remember I had a friend of mine who uh, started dating someone and, and she was freaking out about him talking to people when we went, you know, out dancing. And I'm like, these are the same women he's talked to when we were all just friends. Yeah. So now that you're dating him, he can't talk to her anymore. He's not take as far as I know, he's not taking her home and doing anything with her. <laughs> <laughs> he's talking to her. And this is someone he knew before he met you. And that this like incensed anger that came up in her and it wound up being a fight and she stormed off and we were on a street corner and I was just like, What are you doing? So he should know. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Don't do this. He should know thing. Guys, uh, people aren't psychic. Partners aren't they psychic. Are. They can't just know that you're upset about, why don't you guys have a, like, a conversation about this and find out why this upsets you and, and find out a way to make this work instead of he just has to stop talking to her. I'm like, what is up with that? You can talk to people and he can, I'm here. My husband's home. I'm dancing with other guys. My husband doesn't care because he we're strong enough in our – and she got offended by that and, got, and didn't talk to me for like six months. Well, you have the – and I'm – How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was just like, I'm trying to help you out because you're, you, their, their relationship imploded and they wound up breaking up. And she didn't realize that she was her own worst enemy here, that she was so inflexible and – that whole idea of you're with me and you can't talk to anybody else. I don't get why monogamous people do that. I think you could still be monogamous and still like appreciate the pretty girl that's, you know, sitting next to you or appreciate the handsome man that is talking to you. And I don't think it lessens the, the strength and bond and quality of your relationship. And, it, uh, and just like you said that how people can get so rigid or, and you know, when life changes or how they, feel about each other changes or what they need to do physically changes like having kids so many relationships fall apart because suddenly your body has changed and your brain has changed it's hard for you to be a fulfilled sexual being you don't when when you like feel dumpy and you're in sweatpants and you got spit on your shoulder it's really hard to feel like a sexy person understand <laughs> yeah and how that can very quickly make people go, well, no, it's not the way it was. I have to end it. Maybe, you know, that, that, um, 
going with the flow in relationships and realizing that maybe right now this is all we need and trusting that you will find a place that feels really good for both of you seems to happen more in the non-monogamous community than it does in the monogamous community. Unfortunately, because I feel like there are a lot of people in, you know, monogamous relationships who are otherwise very good for each other. Mm -hmm. There may be this one thing that's causing a problem and and it's, it's because it's, it's the one thing that's causing a problem. It's the one thing they're constantly focusing on. Mm -hmm. Often they're completely ignoring options that could really work for them and actually be more beneficial because it's not the way it should be. Right. Oh, totally. And that whole idea of that's not the way it should be. You know, we're fighting um, what media tells us what it should be, (laughs) what our parents have told us what it should be, um, what religion has told us what it should be. There is so much that couples in, you know, have to break free of and i and you see it when people are dating and and uh things aren't happening a certain way and it's like do you realize that what you're asking for is what happens in a movie (laughs) or in a tv commercial or on a sitcom and is not actually um sustainable in real life and uh i i think a lot of people don't see that and for me, I, I, I recently, I've been trying to figure out, like, because this is my first committed relationship and I've never experienced, I guess, or I hadn't experienced, like, true love, I guess, <laughs> um, I've been trying to find out for myself what a successful relationship looks like. Mm-hmm. And I, I just sort of came to the conclusion that it was people working and loving and living together. Mm-hmm. And whatever that means. <laughs> and I, I find that, you know, having my boyfriend here who, you know, is my submissive and loves me dearly and worships me and thinks I'm the best thing on earth is great. And I also think that having, you know, Noah who lives with, who doesn't live with his girlfriend, Rachel, um, but I see him, you know, a couple times a week and we hang out and go to parties and I just dyed his girlfriend's hair um, yesterday. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, having Shlomo, who I, I see less regularly, but he, he's more of my, like, uh, let's say, like, intellectual friend. We, we share a lot of those same sort of uh, bloggy, I'm, I'm smart, I know this thing sort of, yes. <laughs> sort of habit. So they, they all end up fulfilling needs that I have. And none of them are being overlapped. None of them are being overshadowed. And, and for me, this is like, the closest to a fairy tale that I, I, I suppose like I could really want. Mm. Because, you know, you found different ways to have different parts of your needs met as opposed to uh, fulfilling just one and feeling like either you just have to give up on um, having any other need met or trying to make your partner <laughs> figure out how to fulfill all the needs that they can't do naturally, which I think happens in a lot of um, monogamous relationships where they can't just be uh, uh, happy with that one part that that person fulfills for them. They have all these other needs and then they sort of ask that other person to either change or add things or, you know, you have to kind of, figure out how to like that thing or want to talk about that thing. And I love that you found um, this great definition for yourself of what uh, fills your bucket with every one of these people and that it all works so well and you're not trying to uh, create something artificial to um, fulfill something that you need. I think that's what's also wonderful about being able to find things in other people. And this is what I've learned in um, us trying to deal with being apart from one another is going just because we're not here and we can't um, physically touch base with each other. We do have this wonderful ability to go find comfort in other people and not feel like we're going to lose this other person that we have, you know, and we have to redefine what's going to help us feel good about what we have um, rather than trying to force it and make it into something that 
is going to stress the other partner out. I like that. that that's very considerate, kind to each other's hearts, mm-hmm. which, I, which I think we, we aren't, we, we, uh, in a lot of times we're not really that kind to each other's sort of like simple needs, like the most base human needs, because we feel like as humans, we're supposed to be able to control them and know better. And we should, you know, we should, we should, we should. Mm. And the reality is, you know, the, the old adage, the heart wants what the heart wants. And there's nothing you can really do to change that. Right. Very true. And also being kind to yourself and knowing that um, you're doing everything you can um, for that other person. Because that whole thing of shoulds and shoulds and shoulds, I've done that where I've sat there and had, because, you know, when depression is whispering those evil thoughts to me, that I'm not a good enough partner and I'm not very good at being a parent i'm not seeing to everybody's needs uh you know i i I can't do this right and i can't and you do you start to build this whole uh sort of (laughs) something it's like you you start shooting on yourself (laughs) 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 that's what somebody told me (laughs) and you, you can't even now at this point be there for these other people because you're so down on yourself because I didn't see to that need and I I wasn't there for that. And uh, the fact that you're even there in that person's uh, life and they're happy that you're there and you're giving something to each other. If it's not perfectly everything that, that uh, you can't meet everybody, every need, every need the other person has letting go of that and stopping the shoulds. You know, I, I do this, constantly i have to have moments where i realize i'm asking too much of myself as a partner not even that i'm asking my partner too much sometimes i ask too much of myself um and i try to give something to my partner that i actually can't physically give Mm -hmm. um and then next thing you know you're depressed and you're not able to give anything yeah so that's another way to think of it and with me that that the, the only time i really had to sort of deal with that was when um we were formulating the dynamic of our relationship uh, that is with Bubby. And he is a submissive mostly, but mm-hmm. sometimes he'll, you know, want to be in control over someone or, or sometimes he'll want to like top me. And honestly, although I used to enjoy it a lot in my older age, I just don't want to, <laughs> I just don't want to anymore. Right. Um, so it, it it doesn't interest me. I also think that it simply might be difficult because he is my submissive, and I don't I don't exactly know how to wrap my head around um, being submissive to him specifically. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't fit the dynamic of where you are right now. Right. Yeah, and 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 it's very similar to um, uh, the difficulty my husband has being dominant. That I, we don't, that's the one thing that we don't provide for each other because from coming from a very traditional stance on um, that relationship, it's really hard for him to take a dominant tone when he, when I'm the wife and the mother of his kids and I need to be cared for. So I go and I find that with other people (laughs) who don't have that connection with me so it's sort of like the opposite it's like you are having a hard time um at this stage of your relationship in your in your life uh being able to turn that off and switch um and and the freeing moment is going well i don't have to exactly because um i can go okay this doesn't feel right for me and i would love to be you know ggg about this but right now i wouldn't be giving you what you want because, I I, I, you know, it, it's just not there. So the gift that you're giving them is being honest about it and um, helping them find, you know, uh, that somewhere else. And, you know, I, I can't give him that. But <laughs> I have been able to give him something else, which is my help in developing strong, mutually beneficial relationships with other people. Exactly. Um, right now, he's he's developing one with, with a, a guy who is – 
from a very similar background as he is. Mm-hmm. So he has a lot of the same issues with like dealing with emotions. He's also very submissive and he's not going to be the one that is going to say, we need to do this to make sure that we are on track. Mm-hmm. So I am imparting my wisdom um, and the things that I've learned in, in our relationship to Bubby uh, so that he can try to develop something similar with his new boy. And I really hope that he'll be able to do that. Oh, that'd be wonderful. And it is. That's, that's a beautiful gift. That is beautiful. And I did, I did want to say one more thing, because I think it's about time to head out of here, even though this conversation is freaking amazing, and I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> oh, I know, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> like, a couple steps back, we were talking about, like, how to remind people. You, you had mentioned that he, he has a hard time um, giving you a dominant hand when you need to be cared for your husband. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I was lucky in the fact that Oftentimes, what Bubby needs to be taken care of is a dominant hand. Because mm. he's very stubborn, very resistant. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if, if he doesn't want to get up and go take a shower, or if he doesn't want to um, eat or whatever, then I'm like, Bubby, if you do not get up and do this, you will get a spanking. And while I know you will enjoy the spanking, I will spank you before and after the shower, and it'll be more painful after, and you won't like it. So- <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And it's not going to be the spanking that you want. It's going no, to be the spanking I'm going to give you. <laughs> exactly. And we're definitely not using that bamboo rod that you like so much. In fact, we're <laughs> going to use my favorite, the bamboo cane. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and it works. And it, it, it allows him to be taken care of and it allows for like sexy time and, mm-hmm. you know, all these other things. And the other thing I've sort of done with him uh, recently for our anniversary, his he's, he's a uh, puppy, a human pup. Mm, yeah. So his collars are very important to him, and I bought him a new uh, tag uh, for his birthday, I think it was. Oh, yeah. sweet. Yeah, for his birthday. Mm-hmm. And one of the problems that he has constantly is that he's having a hard time remembering that everything's fine and that people love him. Yeah. Thank his family for that. Uh, but on the tag, it just says, my dear pup, Bubby Nichols, you are loved. Aww. And it is, it, I, I, it's just his way to, or something that he can look down to all the time yeah. whenever he's feeling worried. And, you know, m- the person who loves me most in the world made this for me and everything's going to be all right. Oh, that's great. And it's true. When you're dealing with all of that stuff that's in your head, you often need those little reminders. And uh, and this has come up with a lot of, you know, people, you know, the people I reach out to when they're like, oh, I can't believe you're thinking that. And I can't believe. And I was like, no, there are times where I just need, I actually do need the reassurance because there's so much chatter going on in my head telling me the opposite that. I need the, to find that thing that reminds me that there is this other truth out there. And it's nice that Bubby has that thing that he can turn to, that when those voices and those lies are going on uh, you know, in his head, that there's a centering place that he can go to and remind myself, no, I am loved. And I am important. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, I think we all all of us that deal with depression, that is the hardest thing to overcome is that feeling of uh, we have no place in the world, the universe has forgotten us, or that people don't like us suddenly, or um, uh, people are shining us on. They don't really care about me. They're just being polite. It's amazing this um, dialogue that can come up. Uh, where we can forget that there are people who care about us and that I know for me also it's that I can still be hot and I can still be sexy and uh, there are people who want to get with this (laughs) I can forget that and and it's tough when you are fully stressed and you're you're not getting out and I think that's why I need to you know go out there and and stop listening to that Right. And and go and find new play partners and find new partners and date and go out and um, rediscover my life again because that's what's happening is that that voice is is becoming a little too loud and I'm starting to listen to it and it's 
not true. But when you go out and you um, have that one-on-one -on -one connection with people or go out and um, cultivate these people around you uh, like you have with your partners, it's uh, it makes it harder to let that falsehood take root because you have people who are going to remind you that you are awesome. <laughs> Oh, and I think that's a good place to end it, sadly. No. Uh, so before we get going, why don't you tell people where they can find all the wonderful stuff that you do and all your great insights? Oh, thank you. You can uh, find me at my website, www.technogatia.com. You can also find me at Life on the Swing Set, www.lifeontheswingset.com. Um, I'm on Twitter at Technogatia. I'm on Facebook at me as Miko Technogatia. I'm in FetLife as Technogatia. <laughs> Basically, if you put Technogatia in everything, you probably will find me. Um, I, you know, if you want to listen to podcasts, you can go to Swing Set FM and several of the podcasts that I'm on are there. Everything from Kinky Geeks to Life on the Swing Set to um, the television stuff that I do about Twin Peaks and Hannibal. Um, and uh, there's a link on my site to a lot of the writings that I do. Uh, so if you want to find stuff that I've written for Evolve World and all those other places in Cyrillus, you can find that there. Um, and you can email me at miko at technogatia.com if you want to get any more information or get any links or just talk to me. Awesome talks. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a great conversation and i'm sure that there will be many articles coming from the topics that we talked about today <laughs> because i i feel like for once i actually got to get through a lot of the things that i personally have been trying to work through and put words to so this is oh, great awesome I, I had a great time it's it was definitely nice to have that yeah this is someone that is so like is going through the same thing i am and when we when you find kindred spirits it it lights you up it really does yeah so thank you Thank you. Have a great one. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. <laughs>